It was a sadistic murder. He was called the Hangman of Riga. My God, this is a Nazi criminal. What is he doing here? This is something that the state of Israel could not tolerate. The plan is like the best spy novel. Gather all possible intelligence about him, befriend him, and kill him. Summer, 1964, Brazil. Latvian Nazi Herbert Zuckers is living quietly in Sao Paulo. For the man known as the Hangman of Riga, it is a peaceful life. But all that is about to change. Zuckers was photographed in Brazil by someone from the Jewish population. They have heard of him, and they know who he is. Zuckers was involved in some of the most vile crimes of the Second World War. Zuckers, together with the Latvian Nazis, killed thousands of innocent people, children and elder people and women. And there's a lot of testimony, which I've read in archives from after the war, in which Zuckers, 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 the name keeps coming up. The photos of Zuckers travel halfway around the world to a special Nazi hunting unit within Israel's secret service. They kick off one of the most daring missions in the Mossad's history. September 1st, 1964, a Mossad agent is called to a meeting in an operational apartment in Paris. His commander tells him, we have a very special mission for you. We want to send you to South America to find for us a Nazi called Tsukos. He tells him, your name from today onward is Anton Künzle. He told me that Tsukus was living in Brazil. Tsukus was an officer in the Latvian Air Force before the war. Mid-1941, Hitler invades Latvia. Then Zukas joins up with a gang of murderers and cutthroats. They went around following Nazi orders to go and commit atrocities on the Jews in Riga, capital of Latvia. They saw him personally snatching babies you know, from the arms of, of, of the mothers and, and killing them. They burned the synagogue with 300 people in it and didn't let anybody run out. He told me that Tsukos was responsible for the extermination of 30,000 Latvian Jews. Thinking of my parents, who both died in the Holocaust, I agreed immediately. Anton Künzler was the perfect choice for this kind of operation. Uh, first of all, because of his background. Künzler grew up in Germany when the Nazis came to power. German was his mother tongue. He was part of the team that kidnapped Eichmann four years earlier. Unlike a desk murderer such as Adolf Eichmann, Zuckers literally had blood on his hands. And they think, what are we going to do? Are we going to do another Eichmann? Are we going to kidnap him? Conduct a trial? Or are we going to do something quite different? They decided this time not to kidnap him and not to put him on trial, but to execute him and have the public reaction to it. The plan. Kunzel will befriend Zuckers and lure him out of Brazil. Assassinating him on Brazilian soil is risky. There could be retaliation against the large Jewish population. If Kunzel is caught, he could be executed. We called him the deceased from the beginning. We were confident the mission will succeed. They wanted to make Nazis all over the world fear of their life. Despite the danger, the Mossad agent has one condition. I asked to go only alone. No squad to watch about me. If it was discovered that somebody was guarding me, it might be my end. But to work alone, he needs a cover story. 
I became an Austrian businessman, Anton Künzle, who was a former Nazi, who intended to develop tourism to Brazil. I started growing a moustache. I went to a tailor and ordered a summer black suit. At the oculist, I faked the result of my examination so that I could get prescription glasses. If my glasses would have been fake, Zuckers might have suspicions. Kunzel looks like your classic anonymous Western European guy. He's sort of balding, he's got a moustache, he's got glasses, he's a little bit tubby. If you walk past him in the street, you wouldn't remember him. And he's the perfect spy. My bald head and my belly are the means which make me trusted to everybody I meet. He gets a new passport. And then he goes around Europe, creating this completely new identity. He printed business cards. He ordered special and expensive stationery. He relied on that absence of global communication to get every piece of paperwork he needed. Everything is like something out of a real vintage thriller. Armed with a new identity, the Mossad spy begins the next phase of his assignment, the hunt for the hangman of Riga. I booked a ticket to Rio de Janeiro. I intended first to stop at Rio de Janeiro to know what Brazil is like, and then to advance to Sao Paulo close to the objective. He uh, toured around a couple of days to uh, establish his cover story, tried to build up some contact to the local uh, tourist industry. I told them that they were interested in investments, and they gave me recommendations to San Paolo. I got their personal uh, cards, names, and their addresses. I left signs in every corner to assure my identity. When Anton Kinsler was given the mission of uh, finding Tsukus, he really felt that he is doing a holy mission. His mother was killed in Auschwitz. His father uh, died in concentration camp of Theresienstadt. I feel a certain debt to my parents. But the mission isn't just about revenge. Many European countries are about to formally declare that the time for prosecuting Nazi war crimes is over. Israel will never accept this. Even though 20 years have passed, some people don't forget. After a week in Rio, Kunzel moves to Sao Paulo and his target, Herbert Zuckers. I went to the place where Zuckers was. I saw him. Zuckers at the time was renting boats and also he was running a plane service he flew uh, little seaplanes, and he would give people tours of Sao Paulo. Tsukos is living in Brazil for the last 20 years. Like many high-ranking Nazis, after the war, Zuckers escaped to Brazil. The Brazilian government is fanatically anti-communist and turns a blind eye. Kunzel knows if he is caught, they will be far less sympathetic to an Israeli spy. Künzler understood that this is something uh, never done before in the Mossad, because he was sent to Brazil without a backup team. 
and he was working solo by himself uh, in order to approach Tsukos, gain his confidence, and eventually bring his uh, death. He seemed very strong, quite uh, physically fit. I would have to take this into account. I decided to return when I was sure I was ready. Forty-eight hours after sighting his target, Agent Kunzel returns to the marina, this time to meet with Herbert Zuckers. I decided to hire him for sightseeing flight over San Paolo. Zuckers is a very good pilot. In the 30s, he was a national hero in Latvia because he uh, built an airplane flew from Riga to Gambia in West Africa. Non-stop flight. Zukas was indeed the Latvian Limburg, the most famous man of daring do in Latvia and that part of the world at the time. After the flight, the Latvian Nazi invites the Israeli spy for a drink. He took us to his captain's cabin. I saw a gunner on his boat. I got tense because for Tsukos there was no problem to murder. Anton Künzler started telling Tsukos that he's a businessman, showing him he has money, he has connections. Zuckers sees Künzler's obviously a man seemingly of great wealth. Zuckers, on the other hand, has made very, very little money running his flying boat hire pleasure flight business. But he lived extremely modestly and he had uh, financially a very, very tough time. I told him that I had come to invest capital in South America in to tourist business. You are connected to it. It would interest me to talk to you. And that's his way of tugging at Zuckers' greed. Zuckers admits quite quickly to Kunzel that he has this incredibly dark past. He said, you know, they say I am a war criminal. His remark that I'm a Nazi criminal could be a way of testing to see who is the guy in front of him. And uh, Künzler showed no, no, he didn't react, you know. He said, OK, so people say you are a Nazi criminal. I mean, OK. He asked Künzler, what were you doing during the war? I knew he was a captain. In this case, I decided I was a little lower, so I made myself a lieutenant. And uh, he said, and I also was wounded on the Eastern Front. And Suku said, really? I opened my shirt where I had an operation in Tel Aviv Hospital, and I said I got wounded on the Russian Front. He had some sort of mole or something removed. And, of course, he claimed this was some sort of wound that he had received. And, of course, all this helped build up the story that he had indeed been a serving officer of the fatherland. And Zucker started to believe it all. He said, you know, why don't you come to see me during the week in my home? I said, I don't know when I shall come back. Kunzel knows in order to get his man, he doesn't want to, like the suitor at a disco, go in straight away and, and lay his intentions straight up. So he plays the long game. I wanted to let him boil in his oil. Not so quick. Chi va piano, ha volva lontano, va sano. Who goes slow, goes far and goes safe. Künzler went back to the hotel and he sent a message back to headquarters in Tel Aviv. It was in secret ink. The message said, the fish has swallowed the bait.
They left me in doubt, and after a week or so, came back. Tsukos invites Kinsler to have uh, dinner with his family. He lived in a house which looked like a fortress. It's a fortified house with barbed wires around, and dogs, and the searchlights. It was defined enough to show him, look, I'm well protected. It's really going into the lion's lair. No backup team, uh, no protection. If the family is suspicious that he's maybe a Mossad agent, they can kill him, throw away his body, nobody will know about it. I meet his wife, his son. Sukos shows him his medals from the war. He showed him his collection of guns. Handguns, a Mauser, a Beretta, you know, different calibers. I thought it might be a warning. He thought, I like you, but be sure to know that I know how to protect myself. Zuckers wants to always make out that he's the big man. And at the same time as Kunzel's trying to subtly impress Zuckers, Zuckers is not so subtle in the way he tries to impress Kunzel. He tries to make out, I'd be a good business partner for you, and he claims he has this plantation outside town. He took me close to the jungle. It's quite a long drive, and obviously, you know, people will need a little rest break. Kunzel suddenly realizes, because he's circumcised, this could be a problem if Zuckers sees this when they uh, urinate on the side of the road. Kunzel was very cunning about it, and he worked out that if Zuckers actually had seen his penis and, and inquired as to why it lacked a foreskin, he was going to say, ah, well, I caught gonorrhea in a military brothel on the Russian front, and one of the forms of treatment was to be circumcised. At the plantation, the stakes are suddenly raised. Zucker says, hey, I want to have a little shooting match, a little competition with you. He had a sporting rifle with him. I thought it might be my end. Could Zucker have been more cunning than him? Could he have lured him up to the banana plantation to kill him? So they set up a target. Zucker shoots first. and he gets a very nice grouping. And Kunzel goes, well, it's the type of practice Zucker's got from shooting Jews running away from him on the streets of uh, Riga. Kunzel then is given the rifle. And said, do you still know how to shoot? I said, yes. Zucker's did know that Anton was a real marksman. I was the first in Israel to volunteer for the British Army. Künstler made five or six beautiful shots. He shoots within a three centimeter grouping. It's like that classic moment between two men and one had got the better one than the other. So he said, you're all right. Zuckers admits that Künstler is the better shot. It's a key moment in the hunt. And it occurs to Künstler, well, I could just do the job now. I shoot Zuckers, hide his body, Mission accomplished. Nobody will know. I decided not to execute it. I was afraid I might be discovered. In Brazil at the time, there was still capital punishment. Imagine to yourself a Jewish Mossad agent being hanged because he was trying to execute a Nazi. Zucker suddenly accepts that Kunzel probably is what he says he is. He started to call him Herr Anton in order to say, I understand you are the boss. Psychologically, it strengthened Tsukur's confidence. Over the following weeks, the Israeli spy gets closer to the marked man. 
It takes him for a round of, of nightlife, you know, glamour. He notices Zuckers is very in control. He nurses his drinks and he's very nervous about those around him. And at one point he even suspects one of the waiters, I think, of being Jewish and, and thinks that maybe this guy is following him. He was very, very wary of anybody trying to approach him because he, he, he knew, of course, that Eichmann was kidnapped by the Mossad. And at the time, there were stories that the Mossad is hunting Nazis all over the world. Zuckers is borderline paranoid. Anton Künzler continued all the time slowly to implant the seeds of trust in Zucker's mind. A sentence here, a sentence there about his financial abilities and his companies. The moment I am in action, I am very cool. I was confident. Zuckers trusted me. He keeps feeding Zucker's little tidbits that we maybe will set up some company here to do this. Maybe you could get involved, Herbert, me old friend. But Kunzel can tell that there is that suspicion there. So he's very careful not to promise him too much. And Zucker's is getting greedier and greedier. The ka -ching sound is going in his head. He's thinking there's some cash here. Maybe this Mr. Künzler is his way out of lower income class to the world that Tsukos believes he should belong to, like his heydays in the Second World War. And on the first day of the occupation, I was 16 years old. And there was a knock at the door, and there was Herbert Sukos. And they said, you're a Jew. You get outside. It doesn't matter what you were. That's the last time we saw our dad. And that was the beginning of the end. Tukus came in and threw us out of my apartment. He took all our belongings. They built a ghetto in the outskirts of town. Bob wired it, called the Riga Ghetto, where they shoved us into the ghetto, and I kissed my mom goodbye for the last time. The next morning, they were gone. The Jews were driven out of the ghetto at Riga by Zuckers and his men through the forest where tens of thousands of people were murdered. Three people survived, and uh, luckily we have the testimony of some of those. He wouldn't just shoot adults, he would shoot children in front of their parents. And there are testimonies which has him shooting a baby in front of um, its mother. Within four months, I lost my mother and father. My entire family was wiped out. They were killed in the mass graves. You could hear screaming and hollering. The children were hollering, the women were crying. We could actually hear the, the, the guns. Later on, Sukhurs occupied my apartment. And at nighttime, he would have me come upstairs to my own apartment and play the piano while he was entertaining his girlfriends. I could hear Sukhurs laughing and drinking and having fun, and there I am sitting and playing. It was horrible. Even though I survived, it's just something I can never get over. The Israeli spy spends more and more time with the Latvian Nazi. They scout for new investments. They plan future businesses. Kunzel realizes after many more meetings with Zuckers that things are going extremely well. And he realizes that things are now getting into place in order to actually perform the final part of the mission, i.e. the execution. Three weeks after their first meeting, Kunzel tells Zuckers he has to return to Europe to take care of business. I said, I shall send you a telegram, and I left for Europe. I left him hoping he would be a, again a rich and important person. But when Anton Kunzel returns to South America, he will not be alone. In Europe, Anton Kunzel plans the next phase of his operation against Nazi Herbert Zuckers. Kunzel goes back to Paris, where he discusses with his fellow agents what's the best place to kill him. We decided that if we shall execute him, it would not be in Brazil, but in Uruguay. There's a big, big Jewish community in Brazil. 
And if this is seen as Jews killing a Nazi, then there's going to be a backlash um, against the Jewish population. Uruguay was more democratic than Brazil at the time. A very small Jewish minority, it wouldn't cause such a repercussion. And uh, also important, no capital punishment. Montevideo, the capital of Uruguay, they decide that's the best place. They decide to lure him into an isolated place. Someone from the team would read to him a charge that he was personally responsible for the murder of 30,000 Jews of Riga and execute him on the spot. He's a very, very big, solid guy. Uh, and you see pictures of him, and he's got forearms the size of, like, you know, a, a boxers. He's a fearsome proposition. They were expecting to have some kind of a fight. A hit team is built up of uh, four Mossad people. They are given course in man-to-man -man combat. They spend a lot of time practicing their karate moves and, and how to do their martial arts. The hit squad is primed. The bolting spy sends the hangman of Riga a letter urging him to come to Montevideo. As an incentive, he includes a check for plane tickets and expenses. Kunzel decides, I can say that we have a business opportunity we want to explore there. We're a big business. We, we can do this. Zuckers is reluctant because he's very worried about leaving the country. He feels threatened. He feels unsafe because he won't have the protection of his friends and family around. He was always suspicious. But for the impoverished Nazi, the money proves irresistible. Sukos had no passport, so he had to file for a Brazilian passport. And Künzler helps him with background letters and documents saying that he's employing him as his associate. A week later, Zucker sends a telegram to Künzler, confirming he'll meet him in Montevideo. The trap is set. team of Mossad agents fly out, and they fly into different places at different times, but they all meet in Montevideo in order to plan the next part of this mission. And it was very hard for the agents to find the property they needed in which they could kill him. But eventually, they found up this little suburban area, part of Montevideo, what seemed like the perfect property. It was a one-storey house. In the neighboring property, there were builders working. Murdering people can tend to make well a noise, and uh, clearly having a load of builders next door was not going to be helpful. But time was tight, so they thought it'll just have to do. All that's missing is the target. To ensure Zuckers doesn't back out, Kunzel decides to meet him in Sao Paulo and travel with him to Montevideo. And at Sao Paulo, steps off the plane, and there's Zuckers, ready to greet him. Zuckers has a Super 8 camera, and he's filming him. When I step down from the plane, he started in front of me and took my picture. I tried to cover my face. And Kunzel, of course, is absolutely appalled by this because, like any good spy, he doesn't want to be photographed. He then says to uh, Zuckers, hello, Herbert, have you uh, got all your papers to go to Uruguay? Zuckers goes, no, I haven't got them yet. I haven't sort of um, got round to it. I sharply spoke to him and said, if you want business with me, Never do this again. Never send me a telegram, you are ready, and you are not ready. Kunzel decides, I need to behave like this man's boss. And it's a great bit of bluff, because it works completely. I went on, I say, you send me a telegram to Montevideo, to my hotel. In the meantime, let me prepare a visa. Zuckers eventually gets the paperwork sorted out. Sukos get his passport and then he can fly to Montevideo to meet his good business associate, Mr. Anton Künzler. Before he leaves, 
Zuckers does something odd. He gives his wife the Super 8 film he took of Kunzel at the airport. Was it because he just wanted, you know, uh, to have some footage of a short, balding, moustached man? No. Zuckers had this cunning. He was always suspicious of Kunzel. Zuckers told his wife, if anything happens to me, this is the man who is responsible. Five months after the Mossad mission was launched, the Latvian Nazi sends word he's flying to Montevideo. He meets the Israeli assassin at his hotel. They check in into the very expensive hotel, which is also part of the plan, you know, to calm down Tsukurs, to show him that everything is going according to plan. From the beginning, Tsukurs had a dual feeling towards Kunzle. On one hand, you know, he saw it as a, as a chancy encounter with an Austrian ex-officer in the Wehrmacht who is a businessman and he's promising, promising, promising all kind of good things for the future. On the other hand, Tsukors was a very clever person. He was alert all the time. He knew that uh, after the war, he will have to pay for his crimes. He knew that he is not innocent. And he was very suspicious. Zuckers is still greedy for money, and even though he's got suspicions about Kunzel, he's going to go along with it because he's desperate for the cash. So he says to Zuckers, look, I really need your advice to help me find a new sort of business premises, a satellite office. So uh, could you help me come and have a look around a, a few, like, potential buildings we could use as offices? So the two men do a lot of driving around in a VW Beetle, looking at various premises. It's a way of trying to make Zuckers just feel a bit more relaxed. After going around Montevideo for a while, Anton Künzler tells Zuckers, I want to show you another place. This is his last ride to the villa where they're going to execute him. Anton Künzler needed to signal the team that everything is going according to plan. I left the car without enough petrol. I stopped at a certain petrol station. Another member of the team is waiting on the other side of the road. He signaled him that everything is OK. The lookout alerts the hit squad to meet at the house. They took off their clothes because they were expecting to have some kind of a fight. They knew it would not uh, pass without violent reaction from Tsukos. Things could be very messy and very bloody. Künzler walks first, you know, to show that he's the boss. If I open the door and say, go in, he will not. If I go in, he will come after me. And he's thinking, I can't hear him behind me. Is he, is he going to follow me? Is he suspicious? Is this the moment where suddenly Zuckers runs up to me and just hits me in the back of the head and that's me gone? And eventually he hears footsteps. And Zuckers is, is walking up behind him, and he thinks it's going to happen. She opens the door, walks in. And suddenly, the agents jump on him. Zuckers is fighting for his life. He managed to rush through the door. And the most horrendous fight takes place. One jumped him and they immediately threw him down. He fought like a lion. All these young Mossad agents 
we're all being, you know, held off by Zuckers. Zuckers reached to his own gun. A hammer is produced. Zuckers pretty much crumples, but he's not dead. He started shouting, Lass me speak. Let me speak. And two shots are fired. Into his head. And that was the end of Herbert Zuckers. Agents in underpants, covered in blood, looking down at the hangman of Riga. He was gone. The plan to incapacitate Zuckers and read aloud the judgment against him was abandoned in the struggle. They had prepared in advance a huge trunk. He was put in a box. They attach a note to his blood-stained body, saying, considering the gravity of the crimes of which Helbert Zuckers is accused, notably his personal responsibility in the murder of 30,000 men, women, and children, and considering the terrible cruelty shown by Herbert Sukus, has carried out his crimes, we condemn the said Sukus to death. He was executed on 23rd February 1965 by those who will never forget. He dressed up, and each one went his own way according to plan, and then they all make their way back to Paris. The job is done. Back in Paris, the Mossad team needs to get word out that Herbert Zuckers has been executed. We contacted paper agencies in Uruguay to tell them that the body of this gruesome murderer will be found in a house in Montevideo. He called a newspaper in Paraguay. The telephone call to the agency was received by a junior editor, never paid any attention to it. And the people in the Mossad are waiting one day, two days, three days, nothing happens. No one believes that this has happened. And in the meantime, uh, Zuckers' family are starting to get a little bit worried about what's happened to their loved one. This is the first time Herbert Zucker's son has spoken on television. For the first few days, we thought everything was normal. Then, after a few days, that's when we began to worry. So then, somebody called up another agency in Montevideo and gave them full details. And this time, one of the editors decided this is serious enough and called the police. Twelve days after the execution, Montevideo police find the maggot-ridden body in the trunk inside the house on Cartagena Street. The policeman opened the trunk, and there was Zuckers' body. It had bloated. It was an absolutely vile thing to look at. A thumbprint from the body matches the print on Zucker's passport. As intended, the news travels like wildfire. I was listening to the radio and heard they found a body in Uruguay. I caught this terrible feeling. A wave of anti-Semitism breaks out. Synagogues were burnt down in both Uruguay and in Sao Paulo. There were lots of random acts of low-level violence, but there wasn't any sort of massive reprisal carried out. It seems Israel's message is heard loud and clear. Four days after the body is found, the German government reacts. They extend the deadline on prosecuting Nazi war criminals. But in Montevideo, police have a homicide to solve. The family showed pictures of Kunzel to the world's media. We gave them the picture that was taken at the airport. It was all we had. But it was too late. Interpol were uh, called in to try and find out who this Anton Kunzel was. But of course, he retreated back to the an anonymity of being a, a Mossad agent in some town in the middle of Israel. The case goes cold. It would be 20 years before the Mossad admits responsibility for assassinating Herbert Zuckers. 
I was very proud of the Israelis for doing that. Even though it was horrible, I thought he deserved it. You must always remember, we must never forget. Despite testimony from witnesses like Sasha Semenov, Herbert Zucker's family denies he committed atrocities against Latvian Jews. We have been waiting 60 years for some kind of proof against my father. If the world can't show any documents that prove his guilt, then declare him innocent. My family has been suffering their entire life because of these lies. To this day, the man responsible for Herbert Zucker's death has never revealed his true identity. Anton Künzler came back to Israel. Of course, his mustache was shaved off, uh, glasses thrown away. He continued to work for many years in the Mossad. They got their man, they did it efficiently. Morally, it's problematic, but it is nevertheless brilliantly done. So it was, uh, in many ways, the perfect mission. I am very satisfied. It was never dull in a moment.